right, welcome to CAP 102, Unit 1, a flag for your invisible city's future. I am Lauren Deeg, an Associate Professor of Urban Planning, returning to CAP 102 after a few years. It's great to be back. Great to be back with you in first year. Great to be back with the 102 crew. I've been doing 101 for several years. Uh, I think it's been a, at least uh, two years since I've done 102, but it's great to be back. Reviewing some of the thinking and some of the symbology and symbols and things of that nature that you had with your city's emblem in Cap 101. We remember, uh, Game of Thrones fans will remember some of the different house emblems uh, from the series relating to coats of arms in medieval Europe that you can see for different kingdoms, duchies, uh, principalities, countries, regions. Uh, of Europe uh, that, that date back, and you can see some of the different colors, symbols, animals, uh, uh, other symbology from, uh, from, from uh, different castle, uh, different arrangements and different geometries. I'm, I'm interested, and particularly interested in, the, in uh, this one. This is the, the herald emblem for Bavaria, which was its own kingdom until the unification of Germany in 1871. But that this particular color and this particular pattern has become synonymous and it remains a big part of Bavarian culture, that portion of southern, uh, southeast Germany. Uh, and it remains the, their flag of their free state as, they, as they're part of a united, united Germany. The uh, soccer team, the local soccer team, Bayern München or Bayern Munich, has, uh, as many of us know them from uh, their there, there are several uh, Bundesliga championships as well as UEFA championships also adopts portion of the flag as part of their logo. So this idea of a medieval symbol or medieval geometry or medieval color scheme continues to pervade all the way into modern day and even into the local architecture. Uh, this is Alliance Arena, uh, the new home for Bayern Munich and uh, was also part of the 2016 World Cup. And you can see the pattern there of these uh, of these vacuum formed plastic uh, 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 kits, uh, kit of parts here. Uh, the outer facade is, is, a, um, is, a, is a, an array of these rhombus pieces that are vacuum formed, or uh, otherwise, I believe it's a polycarbonate uh, plastic that forms the outer facade of the stadium itself. And it is patterned uh, on the geometry of the Bavarian flag, so they take the opportunity to reflect the Bavarian flag and herald emblem uh, in the facade itself. And they can project almost any color onto it, including the German flag here, as well as other team colors and other visiting team colors and the like. And did so during the 2016 World Cup and, 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 and did do so uh, during all of the Championship League games that they host there today. So an interesting link between uh, a herald emblem, a flag, uh, the colors, and the architecture of a region. Interesting linkage between all those different things. This is a proposal by Rem Koolhaas, a Dutch architect and planner uh, you may have heard of, uh, where he was uh, seeking to create a new flag for a united Europe during the time of European unification. And you can see in bits and pieces here, if you can start to divulge, you can see the different flag schemes for different uh, countries coming through. Here's Iceland here, here's Germany here. Actually, Germany's here, this is probably Romania. You can see Greece, the flag color scheme for Greece here, Denmark, uh, United Kingdom, and others. So that he wanted to create this interesting barcode that would reflect or include all of the colors of the different European flags as one unified European system. Uh, it, it is ongoing. It has not been adopted, but it, it is, remains a proposal for a united Europe and a, a different flag for a united Europe. Flags and emblems and logos do go together. You may remember this um, uh, from discussion during our, our Herald uh, unit in 101. Uh, the, the new logo for Louisville City uh, soccer team includes portions of the skyline as well as a reference to uh, bourbon barrels, but also includes elements of the fleur de lis uh, reflecting the French heritage of Louisville as a French colony, uh, as a French colony city and references back to the city flag. Also with the case of the Indy 11, we have a logo that references uh, uh, the victory statue atop the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. We have a checkerboard pattern that re reflects the, in the uh, uh, city's racing 
heritage. We have we have the star, which references the star in the city's flag, the famous circle flag, and a color scheme that actually reflects uh, a former regiment of, of Indiana, uh, an Indiana regiment that served in the Civil War. So the entire color scheme makes references to a lot of different things, but 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 notably, the city flag has a, a portion of the identity of the Herald. So there's a, some interesting. Uh, uh, exchange here between uh, sports teams and uh, their city flags often uh, and are reflected sometimes in city edition uh, uniforms that you might see in the NBA or NHL or in the MLB. Roman Mars, uh, author of the 99% Invisible City book, no relation to Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities, I'll make that, I'll make that uh, reading available to you. Uh, but do take a look at his TED Talk. It is formatted a little bit different than the other TED Talks because it is formatted as a radio show or as a podcast. So a very different way of, of, of giving a speech or giving a presentation, but I think an interesting format that uh, yeah, that you all will become very familiar with in the coming years as podcasts become more pervasive in the conveying of information and ideas. Some of the principles that uh, Roman Mars echoes from the National Vexillological Society uh, in the terms of how one designs a city flag, keep it simple, use meaningful symbolism, it actually means something to the people, use basic colors, not outlandish colors and, and other colors and that become difficult to reproduce can be, can be difficult. Uh, the, the idea of using basic colors is important, uh, that the flag can be easily reproduced. And, and as Roman uh, echoes the idea that a, a child should be able to re reproduce a flag very basically. No lettering or seals. Some of our better flags do, don't follow that rule, I know. And be distinctive or be related. So be, to be completely recognizable or be related to uh, other families of flags, I think pretty consistent what you see in terms of national flags. But uh, good discussion here about how some city flags follow these good principles and how some city flags do not current debate about the, the San Francisco flag in terms of how it doesn't follow those principles, but also how it's not exactly celebrated the way the Chicago flag is, or even the Indian Indianapolis flag for that matter. So there have been some other um, uh, uh, different proposals for a new city flag that would reflect perhaps past flags uh, from the early 20th century, but also reflect more of the city's culture, including the pervasive fog uh, that's existing, that exists in the San Francisco Bay region and then other, other proposals that look for a more modern or more forward or more progressive, more positive uh, outlook or uh, uplifting or otherwise um, uh, symbolism of the Phoenix, the idea of, of San Francisco rising from the ashes of the great earthquakes and fires. New Zealand, the country of New Zealand had a referendum, public referendum in the mid uh, teens, recently 2015 to 2016, with many proposals to reconsider their flag, uh, uh, many, many drafts and, and submissions from artists from all over uh, the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, you can see some inclusion of some Maori sacred symbols such as the koro uh, or different variations of the koro. Uh, the koro is a sacred symbol uh, to the indigenous people of New Zealand known as the Maori. And uh, because it is the, the nautilus or the spiral is, is found in many different uh, uh, portions of the culture, including when one puts an oar into the sea, but also um, the silver fern, which is a plant that grows uh, uh, ex extensively across New Zealand. The idea of the fiddlehead fern or the fern um, uh, symbol as it grows in terms of this fiddlehead's uh, design or, else, or, or the fern leaf itself, uh, we find across a lot of different uh, symbolism across New Zealand. So a lot of artists uh, made proposals to include uh, that symbology in a proposal for a new flag. The reference to the fern, perhaps uh, more recognizable, the New Zealand national rugby team, they are known as the All Blacks, and they have had a silver fern on a uh, crest on their uniform uh, for over 100 years. The current flag, yeah, very similar to Australia's flag, including the Southern Cross uh, star constellation, but with red stars as opposed to Australia, which uses white stars. Australia also has a uh, multifaceted star in the lower left. But the confusion between or the similarity between New Zealand and Australia was one of the reasons why they wanted to choose a different different flag. Also, the inclusion of the Union Jack as a form of a naval ensign. Many of the 
former British colonies do adopt this as almost a naval style flag that they have Union Jack in the upper left. Um, some folks in New Zealand wanted to move on from that in terms of their colonial past. So some good discussion online, on television, and uh, across New Zealand uh, with a lot of, lot, again, a lot of designers submitting different designs that were re related to the original, or not the original, but the uh, current one, but uh, also some interesting local variations and, and, and uh, indigenous appropriate variations. But you can see a sort of a, a scheme kind of coming through here as we go from the many designs that were submitted narrowing down to some more simple and more direct uh, designs that became part of the, the, the referendum. So the referendum had a two-tiered referendum. Uh, the first referendum eliminated and, and shortened the list. The final referendum basically narrowed it down to these two choices, whether to retain the current flag or to adopt this variation uh, with the black, the silver fern, the blue, and then retaining the Southern Cross star constellation. And so it came down to this. And the rev result with 56% with of the vote, with only 67% of eligible voters, was to retain the current flag. So um, unfortunately, if you will, for those who wanted to see some change, uh, um, the, the idea of, of retaining the current flag uh, did in fact uh, become the result of the referendum. Uh, with with relatively low voter turnout as far as New Zealanders are concerned. Australia and New Zealand has a pretty high voter turnout typically for their elections, usually 85 to 90%. Uh, so this was seen as a low voter turnout. This would be probably a high voter turnout in the United States, but uh, they did in, in fact vote to retain the, the current flag. So other things to, to sort of remind us and refresh us about uh, different design principles that are involved in flag design. Uh, we talk about balance, we talk about proximity, uh, we talk about intensity of shade or intensity of color. It'll lead to different compositional uh, entities as well as balance. So, so, let's, so it's a good, good exercise to sort of review different things like visual weight uh, or, uh, and orientation or how solid shapes relate to one another in terms of their effect or presence. So some good things to re as we look at this to, uh, to review in terms of basic graphic design principles and basic design principles of balance, and color, and contrast, and ordering systems as well, uh, going back into uh, reviewing our Qing ordering systems um, uh, in terms of, of symmetry and, and uh, radial and cluster centralized, all those principles that we remember from 101, 161. Balance, of course, can be achieved sometimes with asymmetry uh, in terms of how visual weight and how different things counter each other. We see this in flag design quite a bit. The example here from Piet Mondrian, uh, even, even though there are pervasive colors, the grid itself has a way of balancing out the composition. And then other other uh, demonstrations of visual weight, but also uh, visual contrast, where more com more smaller, more complex uh, objects can can in fact balance a composition against larger objects. So all those good good things that we remember from basic design, basic composition, good things to be practicing here as we come to come up with a flag design. I love the work of Frank Stella, uh, not only as a sculptor but as a painter. His color schemes are really fantastic in terms of how. He balances warm and cool colors, but also more intense colors versus less intense colors. We'll have more discussion about color theory and color principles in, in the next unit. And just some more examples of interesting balanced visual contrast and, and visual compositions. Some examples uh, from, from past years, uh, we encourage you to revisit your invisible city, re-engage re, re with it, imagine its future in terms of how it, um, it might in, endure a radical change and how the people of your invisible city might rally under a new flag. So referencing and remembering the emblem that you designed uh, from last semester, but not entirely copying it. Um, uh, we have some examples here of how uh, some of the new thinking about how the invisible city might have a future 
a new future or a new uh, establishment or a new civilization or a new place could become a very interesting narrative for us to work with here in the new semester. So uh, these are examples from uh, past years. We are looking for a nicely rendered uh, final product with lots of study sketches leading up to it, as well as a design statement that is hand-lettered that explains uh, some of the ideas being explored here. And see your instructor for more details on deliverables and dates and submission. Thank you very much.